Uh, this is an interview for um, the Internet Radio Show Macht und Menschenrechte, Power and Human Rights um, on uh, Jungle Drum uh, Radio. Um, I will now uh, speak with um, Mr. Robert Kahn. Um, Mr. Kahn um, is a Stephen A. Tenenbaum Senior Fellow for International Economies and uh, he's um, um, work, he's Senior Fellow um, for International Economies at the Council on Foreign Relations. And he has worked also for the International Monetary Fund on the um, solution of debt crisis for emerging markets. Uh, and um, in his career, he, in addition to that, has worked for, um, as a senior strategist for more capital and um, as he has been in several senior level positions at the City Group. And we are talking about uh, state uh, insolvency procedures. Um, hello, Mr. Khan. Many thanks for taking your time for our interview. Well, thank you for uh, having me on today. Um, Mr. Khan, you have uh, published uh, several articles um, on the CF. Uh, our website um, uh, regarding uh, debt crisis. And um, the first qu question I would like to ask is about um, the term debt um, sustainability. Um, what is uh, your position on Professor Dr. Cephas Lumina's um, criticism? He's a former UN independent expert on state debts and human rights that today uh, creditors interpret the term debt sustainability too much narrowed on uh, the debt repayment capacity and that it should, uh, from his point of view, be uh, better focused on the ability of the debtor state to fulfill uh, the human rights obligations of the debtor state. Well, I certainly think the, their human rights obligations and a whole range of other social commitments countries make are hugely important to sustainability in the broad sense. I think there is a middle ground between though, his criticism and I think what many economists do in focusing on debt repayment. And I think the middle ground is to say that while well, you do have to look at the math, you do have to look at debt repayment capacity, how much debt a country can service and pay depends on many different uh, factors. Why is it, for example, that in Japan, debt is well over 200% of the GDP of the country, uh, the debt is still sustainable, whereas in Argentina, when they defaulted, debt was only 60%, uh, and private debt in Greece is very low. Uh, clearly, a country's capacity to manage their debt depends on a lot of things, social cohesion, uh, growth, uh, the commitment to say, for example, in the case of Greece, uh, stay in the Eurozone and the like, and all of those things do weigh in. So I, I do think you need to look at debt repayment capacity. I don't think you should throw it away and say, well, look at these other factors like human rights. But he's absolutely right. Uh, the, I think it's absolutely right to say that any judgment about how much debt is sustainable and, re and can be repaid needs to take this broader range of factors into consideration. Okay. A moment. Um. Um, how do you assess the uh, construction of the ESM that uh, within uh, the state insolvency part of the ESM, uh, the imposed conditions for partly debt relief of insolvent countries uh, are concluded by the assembly of private creditors in contrast uh, to pro the procedure for countries uh, which are regarded uh, as solvent, uh, where the conditions are drafted by the Troika and concluded by their excellences, the financial ministers. I have been quite critical of Europe for not being more willing 
to recognize the need for debt forgiveness. And so I, I think there is a problem with the mechanisms that they have in place. Uh, that, that said, it is still the case that there is a great deal of frustration with the Greek government in the current situation, uh, that they have been, the repeated uh, reform programs have gone off track, and it has required an extraordinary amount of financing uh, from other countries in Europe to them. And so certainly I can understand the feelings of the creditor government in saying, look, we need to have a, a program that is working. We have to have confidence that we, there will be an end to this need for extraordinary financing before we give you relief. And so the idea that you would have a ESM program that would have to complete a first review, hmm. and then on the basis of that, uh, a negotiation of debt relief, I think it makes a lot of sense. Now, certainly, there is, it's possible to have a criticism that this is very vague, that to leave these, have these kind of negotiations without any set rules undermines the benefits that can come from people knowing that their debt will be reduced to sustainable levels. And certainly I would see uh, a lot of value in, uh, in producing a more rules-based approach, something that would have the nature of an insolvency mechanism, uh, something like what the Paris Club does for low-income countries. So certainly I think there is value to that, but I also recognize, that, particularly in the case of Greece, that, that in some sense it's going to still have to be contingent on policy reform. And, and given how uncertain developments are right now, that will take some time to, to be able to be put in place. And so there's going to be an element of negotiation that's really going to be unavoidable. Um, my uh, question is hinted at the uh, construction with the ESM has that there's an assembly of private uh, creditors which can also make uh, conditions on a country. Well, certainly, you know, we have, uh, we need to have policies both for the private creditors, what we call now private sector involvement, and also for the official creditors. I think that it is right that we probably wait too long to restructure Greece's private debt in 2012. We probably should have done it a year earlier. As a result, uh, even though those private creditors took a very significant loss, and we shouldn't forget that, there were important losses imposed on the banks, uh, and as a result, so many creditors got out, and so in the end now most of Greece's debt is public. Hmm. And so ultimately now debt relief for Greece uh, and the ESM insolvency is really simply a question now of official claims on Greece, official debt. Uh, in that sense, it's very different from, for example, what we're seeing in Ukraine uh, or what we see in a lot of other developing countries where the main debt is private. And I think a different set of rules are likely to be needed uh, for those cases. Um, and how far is uh, a Paris club uh, still needed? If we have, for example, for um, this, we have now this uh, ESM for the Eurozone, um, and how far is the Paris Club uh, still needed for you? I think something like that is needed. Now, for, for your listeners who don't know about the Paris Club, uh, it is an informal meeting that takes place, of course, in Paris of official governments, that have, of governments that have lent money to low-income countries. And when those countries get in trouble, they come to Paris and there's a negotiation. And, and these countries can get relief. Sometimes uh, just simply extending maturities or lowering interest rates, sometimes actual debt re uh, reduction in the debt, contingent on implementing an IMF program. I think that's a model that works very well when governments own money to, uh, owe money to other governments for that official debt. Now, I understand that within Europe, there is uh, uh, it's a pejorative, Paris Club has a certain pejorative meeting. It's associated with developing countries. And I know there are many policymakers in Europe that bristle uh, at the idea that a Paris Club meeting would be convened for a Euro area country. Uh, and I understand that's very sensitive, but I think in terms of the substance of it, it is right to say that we need something like that. So now when we say that, what we mean it for Greece is that they would come to the table to discuss debt relief, and there would be a very explicit set of rules that would allow for uh, particularly the old debt, 
to be restructured with significant concessions conditional on an adjustment program being successfully implemented. I think that is a basic principle. I think it's a very good principle. Uh, I recognize that we'll have to navigate the politics of it, so maybe we won't call it the Paris Club. Why don't we call it the Berlin Club or some other club? We'll need a different name for it to signal that we do understand that it is a different environment when we're talking about a country in the Eurozone than maybe when we're talking about a country in Africa or Asia or Latin America. But I think the economic principles are valuable and needed. You are talking about adjustment. Of which kinds of austerity measures of tax increases and of privatizations have shown to be reasonable to help countries out of an unsustainable debt situation? Well, I think you're raising an important and very difficult question. One of the things we certainly learned from the crisis is that at a time when the world is not growing fast, if we ask a country to do deep austerity, it makes significant cuts in benefits or to raise taxes, in some sense, all of those type of measures will impose a very serious cost to the country in terms of growth. The drag on the economy from these austerity measures uh, is, is, is high. But I'm not sure, on the other hand, we can avoid it. Uh, if you take a country like Greece, that at the start of the crisis had a deficit of 10% of GDP, that is an extraordinarily large number. Uh, Europe came forward with several hundred billion dollars of lending that allowed Greece to have larger deficits than they would have had without the financing. So if you're taking your deficit from 10 to 8 to 6 to 2, at one level, that is still, um, that is austerity. You are cutting your deficit. On the other hand, those are uh, more generous targets than if you didn't have the financing. You're allowing the austerity to be done gradually. So um, in most cases when the crisis hits, countries do have to adjust. Now, I'd like to see this often done in a way which is sensitive, particularly to the social implications of adjustment, and the fact that uh, austerity often hits the hardest on the poor. Uh, that means I think the tax increases should be progressive. I think that in many cases uh, where the tax base is very narrow, uh, broadening the tax base can be an important way to avoiding putting the, the burden on the, the, the least able to carry it. Greece is a great example where actually effective taxes are quite low. A lot of people don't pay much in way of taxes, and if you can broaden the tax net and have upper and middle class people pay more taxes, you can avoid the burden. But I think the, the honest answer is that often in a crisis, you're cutting services which, it, uh, which have an important social effect. And I do think you need to be very sensitive to that as you're designing an optimal adjustment program. And uh, what kind of privatizations do you regard as, uh, as reasonable? Um... Yeah, I mean, I think this is tough. Um, as, a, as a general matter, I'd like to see privatizations in an adjustment effort. I think that if we can bring more money in by uh, selling of assets and putting them into the private sector, First of all, it means you don't have to have as much austerity elsewhere. So it's, I think, a better way of getting the adjustment. I think also sometimes putting those assets into private hands can open up markets. I think if I had one criticism of the way the programs have worked so far in Europe, they have focused probably too much on tax increases and spending cuts and less on opening up markets and dealing with what we call the structural reforms needed to promote growth. And so if I, th I, I look at a lot of these countries and think that putting assets in private hands will make, will make it more attractive for people to come in and to invest. And so that can be a better growth strategy than uh, one which relies simply on budget cuts. So I'd like to see privatization be part of it, but we have to be honest. It's tough. Uh, it often means attacking very strong interests within a country, and there's reasons why they become very uh, invested and, and difficult to move against. Uh, there are often strong social, environmental, labor-related reasons that are difficult with simple privatization. So I wouldn't put in corruption can also be an issue. So the honest answer is the record of privatizations uh, is, is not great. And so we shouldn't have programs that assume that we are going to have a lot of privatization. So, for example, in Greece, 
there is talk of $50 billion in privatization. I think that's highly unlikely, and we shouldn't be assuming it when we do a program. But as I said at the beginning, I do think that to the extent it can let you preserve certain key social programs and also generate a private sector investment response, that can be pro-growth. And what is your opinion uh, about the privatization of public utilities and the privatization of sovereign institutions? Well, on public utilities, I do think you have to be careful. These are, as a, what economists would call, in many cases, a natural monopoly. And so to simply privatize the entire uh, uh, industry actually would not work because they would, you would, in essence, end up with monopoly pricing from the private sector. I mean, there's a reason why you want these to be regulated utilities. But often, I think, in terms of the distribution of the product, there is scope for competition. Uh, and, you know, if it helps you get the prices right, I think that would be a, a good thing. And uh, what, what is your opinion about privatization of sovereign institutions to open up markets uh, uh, for, for sovereign services, uh, sovereign services. I'm sorry, for which kind of services? Uh, sovereign services uh, of parts of the administration, courts, army, police, and so on. I, I think that's very hard. I think these are what economists call public goods. Um, I think it's very hard to uh, to do that in scale. I think there is a legitimate, always going to be a legitimate role for the government. I tend to think privatization should be focused on product markets in general. So, you know, opening up things like pharmaceuticals and uh, maybe certain kinds of transport and the like. Um, there's, a lot of, there's often a lot of sectors where you had government regulation that helps a certain interest, but there isn't, it's not particularly a public good. But I think certainly when you get into core government services, including I think like military and, and, and public, uh, uh, basic public services, I think it's hard to justify Obviously, you have to look at it in a case-by-case -case basis. Um, which limits do you see for austerity measures regarding social benefits? And which um, limits do you see um, regarding tax increases? Well, on the social side, you need to have a safety net that is dependable and that can preserve public support for austerity. And so you definitely don't want to throw out your safety net. On the other hand, you want to make sure it is targeted uh, very effectively. We're talking about Greece here, but I think U Ukraine is actually another great example to look at. Uh, Ukraine had, uh, and before their crisis, essentially an extra their safety net that was based on providing very low-cost energy to the entire population. And it was done for social purposes, but it was incredibly expensive and unsustainable. And so the core part of that Ukrainian program is not is to raise energy prices towards market levels, but at the same time recognize that there was a social safety net element to that. And so you needed to replace that. As you were doing that, you needed to put in place uh, a social program that provided low-cost energy to the most critically in need. And so I do think that most of these countries, I think over time, their social safety nets tend to expand as you know as interests are compete and lobby for, for, for access to it. And I think often we find that they're not well targeted. And so I think what you generally want to do when you get into these crises, when you have to cut back, is find ways of, of targeting the social safety net more clearly on those in need. It might mean means testing. It might mean more narrowing the eligibility and the like. So you don't want to throw uh, the whole program out. Uh, you want to, because otherwise you undermine support for the entire effort. But I do think that you need to put a, a hard... Um, test on it as to whether it really is going just to those people who are most in need. Hmm. Um, how does one find an appropriate uh, compromise between the human rights of the creditors, uh, I think mainly the human right to property, and uh, but also to social security, and of the um, human rights of the inhabitants? I uh, uh, see they are mainly property, social security, but uh, also uh, further uh, social human rights, uh, health, food, housing, uh, if a state becomes insolvent? I mean, ultimately, I think this is what democracies have to decide. Um, and I think that that's why it's very important to maintain popular support for reform efforts, because I do think ultimately these have to be democratic decisions. 
And, um, so there, there are a set of issues about how you balance it against the rights of creditors. Yes. I think that is also something that becomes relevant to it. Now, you know, many of these, many of these countries uh, in good times borrow a lot of money in international markets. And those borrowings, in many cases, allow for very uh, appropriate spending. Not always, but in, some, in many cases. And we want that market to stay in place. And that means that if that's going to work, uh, lenders have to believe that there's going to be a, a very strong effort made to repay them. On the other, so on the one hand, it, it can't be easy to default. A country can't just say, well, I have critical social needs, and so I shouldn't have to pay my debt. If that was the attitude, and if we had an insolvency mechanism or some other program in place that basically made it very easy for countries to default uh, because of social pressures, then you wouldn't have a market. And so many countries that, that depend on, on borrowing to develop would lose access. And I think that would be very tragic. On the other hand, countries do sometimes get in such difficult problems that they have to restructure their debt. And when that happens, you need to have the ability to do so. Now, there are some people who would argue we need a bankruptcy court of sorts, an insolvency mechanism with a judge that would decide that. Um, and that's what's going on at the UN right now in terms of trying to think through how that would look. Uh, I'm not convinced we need to do that, um, but certainly what we do now in terms of a country coming to the IMF, coming to and sitting down with its creditors and saying we can't pay and we need to restructure and to negotiate, uh, it has to be, you know, as I say, there has to be a balance found. It can't be too easy to do it, but on the other hand, when there is a real crisis, you need the ability to do it and to get creditors to come along. And I think that's the challenge right now is to get that balance right. Um, how uh, do you assess uh, the step of the Greek government to apply for an, a loan from the ESM to pay back debts to the ECB, uh, even though uh, the debts to the European uh, Central Bank cannot uh, force Greece into a state insolvency procedure? Yeah, I mean, I think that whether we have a formal insolvency procedure or not, ultimately Greece's debt has to be reduced. And it will be the most easiest to do that if the debt is held by governments, and not by central banks directly. And so I think ultimately the idea of the ESM um, replacing the IMF and the ECB over time is probably helpful to getting debt reduction, however we do it. The package that's being negotiated right now, we, there's, the talk is that it will be in the range of uh, 85 to 90 billion euros over three years. That's a lot of money. Uh, probably about half of that would come from the, this Europe, Europe, Europe directly through the so-called ESM facility. And of that 85 to 90 billion euros, about half of it goes to repay debt. And you could say, well, that's just, you know, uh, turning over, that's not real money for Greece, it's just in, with one hand paying the other hand. But it is this process of, that money will be used to pay off the central bank, uh, who has acquired claims in the process of doing monetary policy. We don't want the ECB to be uh, the, base, the main lender to Greece in, in normal times. We want that to be from governments. Uh, it did acquire the, those claims as part of the rescue packages, as part of doing monetary policy. So if we move that money to the ESM, to, government, to European governments, I think it would be an easier uh, to restructure it uh, over time. So in that sense, I am supportive of an ESM program that does that, and I think it's probably about fair that about half the ESM money will go to debt repayment, the other half will go to fiscal policy or to recapitalizing the banking system, which are also critical needs. Um, what do you think about the idea that uh, I thought the um, that no moment that uh, central banks um, w uh, buy state bonds um, if it's uh, it's a secondary uh, market in order um, to reach again a sustainable debt situation not more and then to leave the bonds without any write off in the balance sheet of the central bank. Uh, yeah, to delay maturities. I, I do think that uh, what we have learned since the crisis started is that when interest rates get near zero, central banks have to do unorthodox things to stimulate the economy. Now, we want the central banks to stimulate the economy when there is high unemployment. That's their job. 
And if they need to do that by buying the bonds of government, what in the United States was termed quantitative easing, and is also now being used in Europe, uh, if, 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 if that's the way in which we can most effectively stimulate the economy uh, when there is a lot of high unemployment, I think the central bank should be allowed to do that. But they should be doing it for the purpose of trying to return the European economy to full employment, not to do it as a matter of debt policy in Greece. And if it does leave them with these extra bonds, uh, I, did, I do have concerns about then making the central bank uh, participate in the debt restructuring. Uh, if the central bank has losses, they end up having to, uh, to sort of send the bill to governments anyway. And so I, I would prefer that, that we do it the way we are doing it, which is let the central bank do what is the right thing to do for monetary policy. If that means that there are government, Greek government bonds on their balance sheet and Greece needs debt restructuring, which they clearly do, Let's have an e the process where the ESM, in essence, over time, buy, you know, takes that debt off the balance sheet of the central bank, above and beyond what's needed for just monetary policy purposes. And then the restructuring is done by governments in negotiation with the Greek government through something like the Paris Club. I think that's the best scenario because it allows then the central bank to do what it sees is the right policy for the economy from a central bank perspective. In um, September 2014, um, a study has been published which has empirically proven the credit creation theory of money. It means that real money, the money on the banking accounts, comes into existence when a bank uh, gives, gives a loan. And um, which implication uh, does uh, this Uh, proof that uh, real money comes into existence when a bank gives a loan have on the too big to fail hypothesis. Well, I think too big to fail is, is a tough is a tough issue in Europe as well as in the United States. Um, you're right to say that under our uh, the kind of banking systems with industrial countries now rely on so called fractional reserve banking systems. Uh, Uh, spending power or money is created. Uh, the, the central bank creates reserves, which are give, then it gives to banks, which then you are used as the basis for lending. And that's the process through which central bank policy uh, creates money or contracts the money supply. And, and I think that that uh, has served economies quite well in the modern period for the most part. But obviously it can be subject to problems, particularly when the solvency of the banking system is, is called into question. I think one of the challenges or one of the concerns we've had in Europe since the crisis is indeed that bank lending has been um, held back by uh, concerns about solvency, solvency of the bank, solvency of borrowers and the like. And so the ECB's actions to ease monetary policy haven't had the kind of lending uh, effect that we would normally expect and would like to see. And so I do think it is a concern that the banks haven't been actually more responsive in, in terms of lending. I don't think there's anything uh, conspiratorial or, or malign about that. I think it's fundamentally that the banks are worried about their balance sheets and they're worried about the quality of borrowers and they're worried about countries. And that has acted as a, a real headwind, if you will, to, to growth. Uh, I, I, I wish that the European governments would move more quickly to a full banking union and move more quickly to fix the balance sheets of European banks so that they would be in better position to lend. I think in the U.S. we did a, a, a somewhat better job of that in that we came very quickly in and forced uh, our big banks to put in place a lot of capital and to merge. Uh, in some cases, there were government, significant government injections of capital. And I think that the positive of that was it restored banks to what they need to be doing, which is lending. And the lending response has been stronger in the United States and Europe. But there's a trade-off. There's a cost to that. And the cost is, and in some ways in the U.S., it made the big banks even bigger. Now, we're trying to address that by um, making those banks now hold higher capital and to have plans to be liquidated if they get in trouble. We call them living wills. But it's not. But there is a trade-off there. We want uh, the, the, you know, the measures that help the banks lend more, which is, I think, good. 
also did contribute to the, the too big to fail. I think over time, all economies have to have, too big to fail will always exist as a concern. Uh, when there are systemic crises, there's always going to be a desire to come in and help save the system, even though that means saving individual firms that may have made bad decisions. But I do think you want to limit it and you want to tax it and since make it costly to make those kind of bad decisions. And so I think ultimately we can do a lot better in making sure that it's, there's not a strong, at least an incentive uh, to do those kind of, uh, for big banks to make these kind of mistakes. Um, I mean, when real money is uh, created by in, in the way that uh, in the moment when a bank gives gives a loan, um, uh -huh. um, as it seems to me that we don't need so, uh, so big uh, banks uh, that they can uh, m raise more uh, loans in uh, relation to the equity of the respective bank. Well, I mean, I think it's certainly right to say that uh, there's a really interesting question there about whether you do need to have big banks. I think that the analytical work on that is quite mixed. There's, there's certainly not a compelling case to say that there are such great benefits to being big that it's worth taking that risk. I think it is right to say that we are in an increasingly globally integrated world in which a lot of companies operate across many countries and that they see a value in having a bank that can operate in all those countries with them. And I think that type of idea is part of what drives banks to get big. But I certainly think you're right to say that it's not at all clear that the benefits are that profound uh, or that you couldn't be equally effective in, in an environment in which you had smaller banks, uh, many, many more banks that were smaller. Uh, I do think there, there are issues to be raised. Uh, I would like to see good regulation, but less, I don't, I don't want to see governments in the position of picking winners and losers and saying, I want this bank to succeed and this bank not to succeed, uh, because I don't necessarily trust governments to make the right choices in that regard. Uh, but I do think certainly if the markets produce a situation where you have larger and larger banks, uh, if you, through your capital requirements, for example, create an incentive for smaller banks to, to develop, I don't think that's at all necessarily a bad thing. In fact, I think that is the way the U.S. is starting to go right now. And you're going to see higher capital requirements on the bigger banks than on the small banks, and I think that will actually be an incentive for exactly the kind of uh, development that you're describing. I uh, mean, that's, uh, so the market access for new uh, smaller banks and so for more competition um, is, uh, is easier this, this way? I think, yeah, I think certainly there is a pro-competitive element. I, as I say, I think there are some economies that come from being able to be, uh, to work with a company across many different countries uh, and many different products, and the large banks have an advantage in doing that, uh, being a one-stop shop, if you will, and there's knowledge and information that comes from being that kind of large bank. Uh, but I certainly think you're right to say that uh, those, those, those advantages can be overestimated. Um, I would like um, to uh, come back um, to the issue of, of human uh, rights. Uh, certainly the, the creditors have human rights, uh, also the people in the adapter countries. How uh, can one uh, make sure that uh, the human rights of both uh, sides are respected, I mean in formal terms? Ultimately, you want to have democratically accountable governments that are able to come to the table and to talk to its creditors uh, on an equal basis and with the, in, in cases where you know, it's judged and merited, the strong support of the international community. That's actually why I've often felt the need to be a strong international monetary fund in these uh, negotiations and these discussions. Often the International Monetary Fund is thought of very negatively by a lot of people in the countries. When they come in during the crisis, they're often coming with uh, the, the call for austerity. They're often seen as people bringing the, bad, the nasty policies and putting them in place. But when it comes to debt restructuring, when it comes to, a, you know, it's their judgment that the debt is unsustainable and their judgment that relief is needed, which sort of in a sense allows the country to have an equal standing at the table with the creditors. And so I think the international community has to provide a framework for these discussions to take place and some rules that allow a fair balancing of interests. Uh, you know, and, and 
ultimately, the best way to protect the human rights in a country is to try and do what you can to avoid getting into these crises. And that means not over-borrowing. It means addressing your problems very quickly and not denying them. And it means generating international support so that when you do need to restructure it, you have a lot of people behind you and supporting your efforts. Many thanks. Thank you for having me on. Many thanks for the interview.